Okay, creating uh, new methods and generics. All right, so to create a new generic function, create a function called uh, use method. All right, and then uh, and it basically takes two arguments: the name of the generic function and the argument to use for method dispatch. Okay, so if you omit the second argument, it will dispatch on the first argument. To, okay, so um, so we we're gonna create. <laughs> and it says use method uses black magic to find them out for itself. Uh, so we, we can create a function called f, and uh, and we're going to have use method for f. Okay. So so right now the function f just says use method for f, which means we're going to have uh, we're going to create basically uh, a function specific for uh, things of class A. Okay. So a generic isn't useful. So so far, if we just have f is use method f, okay, that that is not useful, okay. But we make it useful by creating um, some functions that are specific to its uh, to its thing, okay. So here I'm creating f dot a. f dot a is the method f for the class a, all right. And so basically. The function f dot a, this function, all it's going to do is going to just print out class a. Okay, I, I don't know why it keeps changing um, slides on me. So all it's going to do is going to print out class a. So here I'm creating um, a new class. I'm, I'm creating an object called a, and uh, and it has class a here. All right. So we ask, what is class a? It's a. All right. So a is an object of class a, and then we say, what is f? F given the object A, and it's going to do class A. Does that make sense? What it's doing? Okay, All right, here, let me just kind of show you. Um, so let me clear my uh, global environment here. All right, so here um, we're going to create F as a function. Um, I just want to make sure I've got function of X, and it's going to use uh, use method. Here, okay, so right now f is this. Okay, <clears throat> not that exciting. All right, and then here I'm going to create something. Um, I'll just call, uh, we'll we'll call this JJ. All right, and then so this will be structure. It's just an empty list, but of class A. All right, so what is JJ? It's it's this, but we can say you know what is class of JJ, it's of class A, all right? And so if I call F on A, I'm sorry, not F on A, F on uh, JJ, it says uh, there's no applicable method for F uh, that we can use on class A at this point, okay? So what I have to do is I have to say F dot A is actually a function, okay? And this function is we're going to say, you know, we can write object is class A. This the uh, the function now does this, and so if I call f on JJ, it will say object is class A. All right. Okay. But if I if I try to um, let me do uh, DD, which is just basically going to be integers here. Okay. Uh, if I call f on DD at this point, it's going to say I've got no uh, applicable method here. Okay. So right now, f works on jj because we have we have an f dot a function defined, okay, and the function f itself is use method. So when I'm feeding it dd, okay, which is the the integers here, okay, it's going to look at use method and it's going to try to find find a method specific for integers or numeric objects. And it doesn't find one, so it says, I, I can't do it, all right? Um, all right, so you can uh, add a method to an existing generic, OK? So you know, if I can say, figure out the mean of jj, OK? And, uh, and it's, this is kind of the default thing, but we can do mean dot a, which is now going to be a, another function. Okay, and then it, I'll just write you've asked for the mean of class a. Okay, 
And so now, now that I've defined mean, I can ask, you know, what is mean jj? And it will dispatch the function that I have specific for the, uh, the class A, okay? Because it knows that mean.a is the method specific for class A, all right? Whereas, you know, if I ask for mean of dd, this, this is kind of what we would expect for integers, right? So I've created a new, new method specific to class A, which just says you've asked for the mean of class A. Because what's the class of JJ? It's A. There. All right. So it says, you know, as you can see, there's no check to make sure that the method returns the class compatible with the generic. It's up to you to make sure that the method doesn't violate the expectations of existing code. Okay. So if you're going to start creating uh, new methods, you got to kind of. It's up to you to make sure that it, it's going to make sense. Okay, uh, so use method creates a vector. Uh, basically, um, uh, so when you do use method, it's going to look for something f dot specific to that class, and if it doesn't find it, the, the last thing it's going to do is uh, it's going to do f dot generic. Okay, so or I'm sorry, f dot de default, not generic, f dot default. So. If it doesn't find something specific to the class, it's going to basically just run the default. So you should have a, we have the um, f dot default, and then so here f dot default here is going to just return unknown class. Okay, so f dot default we're going to just say function of x, um, you know, object is unknown class, which is not really true. Okay. <laughs> We'll just say object is something other than class A. I'll say that. Okay, so this is kind of our F default. So if I can still say, you know, what's F J J, and it's going to dis, it's going to look at the class and say, oh, the class of J J is A. So I'm going to do this method specific to F dot A. But right, F dot default says uh, object is something other. Than, so now if I do F dot um, F of D D. Okay, it's going to return that, and I can give it anything else. I can say like blah 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 blah. Okay, and uh, and because it doesn't find the actual class for this, it's going to uh, spit back the uh, the default method there. Okay, so generally when you when you create methods, okay, if you're going to use use method, you should have one specific for the class, and then you should have a default. Uh, f dot default. Okay, if we uh, get rid of f dot default again, and then I ask for this, it's going to say I couldn't find the method for this. Okay, so so we should have um, have a default method. That uh, you know, basically, if it doesn't find its specific class for f dot a, it's going to go to the uh, f dot default here. Okay. All right, and so you know, so here we have like uh, you can see how it in inherits things. Okay, and um, so here we're creating a something called a structure of list where uh, the classes are B and then A, and it doesn't find something specific for B, so it's going to return the, uh, uh, the result for uh, class A. But then if we give it something else entirely, it, it goes through and it doesn't find the specific method, so it's going to return unknown class here. OK, and then it says group generics add a little more complexity. Group generics make it possible to implement methods for multiple generics with one function. And the, uh, the group generics and the functions they include are the math and the operators, the summary functions, and the complex ones. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this. But it's there, OK? Um, you can call them directly. You can call um, f dot default on certain things. 
you can force R to call the uh, the wrong method. Okay, so again, I could call. So generally, so when I use it here, it's going to uh, dispatch the default method. But I could force R to use the method specific for class A. Okay, um, and you could do that, um, but again. Uh, Hadley warns yourself, don't point the loaded gun at your foot. Um, so, okay, so that's S3, all right? And, uh, and now we'll, uh, we'll start talking about S4 and the reference class object types. Um, and so these, uh, just, these are the other um, object-oriented systems that are available in, uh, in R uh, that are uh, more formal, okay? I would say S3 is the most important one that you should familiarize yourselves with, but S4 and reference class uh, are definitely useful as well. Okay, so it says S4 works in a similar way, but it adds uh, formality and rigor. And here, now, um, uh, yeah, methods still belong to the f uh, functions, not classes, but now classes have formal definitions which describe their fields and inherited structures. And then uh, method dispatch can be based on multiple arguments to a generic function, not just one. Okay, and then we have a special operator for extracting the, uh, the fields from an S4 object. Okay. Uh, S4 related code is stored in the methods package. package. This package is always available when you're running R, um, but maybe it's not if you're using it in batch mode. Okay, S4 is rich and complex, we can't explain it fully here, but uh, but here, all right. So you can use uh, O type or is it S4 and it will return true if that's the case. Um, but, uh, but you know, we have some S4 objects, none of the, there are no S4 objects in the base, in base R, but if you load, um, if you load some libraries, then it will produce uh, S4. So we might look at the uh, the stats four package, okay? So for example, um, we can create, uh, if we load library stats four, we can create an object of class MLE, so like a maximum likelihood uh, MLE object, and that's gonna be an S4 type. Okay, so here I've created uh, an object called fit, which is of class MLE, and that's a S4 object, okay? And then so here um, we have generic things, okay? Uh, okay, and then so we have, um, we have a function called knobs here. And this is uh, these are this is an S four uh, class uh, type uh, I don't know system function okay and so you can say you know what is it and then you have um, and then for method dispatch it's a, it's a little bit different but basically uh, we got MLA underscore knobs this is the knobs function specific for uh, MLE. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to me also, all right? Okay, so it says uh, use the is function uh, with one argument to list all the classes that an object inherits from, and then use is with two arguments to test to see if an object inherits from a specific class. So we say, you know, what is, uh, this is basically like the class thing, okay? So, you know, what is fit? And it will say it's a class MLE, uh, is fit an MLE object? Yes. Okay. It says, uh, in S3, uh, you can turn any object into uh, an object just by setting the class attribute. So, you know, we saw that. We could just say, like, oh, I want to make this class data frame. Oh, I changed my mind. I'm going to make it class L, uh, LM or things like that. And, uh, and with S3, it'll do it, and it won't complain, even if things get messed up later on. Okay? With, uh, with S4, you have to um, define the representation with something called set class, 
and then you create a new object using uh, the function new. Okay. And uh, and if you're going to create an S4 class, then you've got um, you have all of these different things. You've got uh, a name, okay, and then you have slots or fields, okay, a, a named list of slots, which defines slot names and permitted classes, okay. So we could create. Let's we're going to create a class called person, okay, and uh, and maybe it's going to be a list consisting of name and age, where name is has to be a character type and age has to be numeric type. Okay? And then uh, and then it will have a string giving the class it inherits from uh, or that it contains. Um, and you can do, uh, and in slots and contains you can use S4 classes, S3 classes registered with S3 or implicit, the implicit class of a base type. Um, this is this is very formal, like, I don't know if you guys are going to do a whole lot of S4 um, programming. I'm, I'm not going to, like, test you guys on it, but uh, it's probably good to know this stuff. Okay, so here we can create a, um, we're going to create a class called person, okay? So uh, this is going to be an S4 class object because we're using the set class function, okay? And uh, as far as a person goes, it's going to have two parts to it. It's got a name and an age, okay? Name takes character information, age takes numeric information, okay? We can create a, uh, another class called employee, okay? An employee uh, includes a new uh, slot called a boss, okay? So if you're an employee, you're going to have something called a boss. And a boss itself is a class of person. Okay? And then the employee itself is also a person, so it's going to contain person here. Okay? So we can define Alice. Alice is just going to be a person with uh, the name Alice and age being 40. Okay? John is a, is a new... Uh, object of class employee and because John is an employee uh, John has a name and an age but also includes this other thing called boss and we're gonna set the boss equal to Alice here okay so we see that things are done very different differently okay uh, well not very differently but we're creating classes using the function called set class you can't just say uh, make this class a okay um, and then uh, whenever if we want a new um, object of that specific class we have to use the function new okay and then to extract the age we use the at sign okay so in lists you're kind of used to using the dollar sign to pull out certain things uh, if you have an s4 object you kind of extract that piece using uh, the at sign or the slot. Okay, so we could we could have done slot Alice comma age, uh, and here uh, we're doing slot for John. Okay, uh, and uh, and we get this. So it says uh, you know what's the slot for um, for John, and we got. Uh, boss for slot what is what is inside the boss slot for object john okay and the the inside that boss slot is an object of class person with the name and age of alice and age of 40. okay um so it says if an s4 object uh contains an s3 class uh it will have a special dot data slot which contains the underlying base type or s3 object so here we can create something called range numeric, which contains a numeric thing, and uh, and it also includes a min and a max. Okay, so range numeric is one through ten with a min of one and a max of ten. Okay, and uh, and so this thing, the data, okay, because it just as contains numeric, uh, the dot data has the numbers one through ten in it. 
So notice we didn't um, we didn't define a, a slot here for the uh, the numeric part. It's just kind of a, a dot data. Uh, so it says you can uh, create new classes or redefine ones, um, but if you're going to do this with S4, uh, it's going to it could mess things up. All right, and so if you want to do something, you can uh, use the uh, set generic and set method for um, the functions. Okay, so we're going to create a function called uh, set generic union. Okay, and then the methods for uh, for union is basically um, if we take uh, you know uh, x and y data frame, we're just going to basically uh, union them together using uh, the unique here. Okay, so this is just the uh, the function here. So it says set set method takes the name of the generic, the classes the method should be associated, and a function that implements the method. Okay, so basically this is just a formal way of creating a function. So we've got we're basically just defining a function, okay? But we're kind of wrapping it and saying like these are the things that it has to take. Okay. So, uh, so if you if you want to create a new generic from scratch, uh, you need to supply a function that calls standard generic, okay? And uh, and this is this is how that works. Okay, so standard generic is kind of like the use method if you're going to create one from from scratch. But here, uh, basically for this one, we're gonna um, we're creating a kind of a new method where union will work for data frames. Okay, where normally it works with just vectors, but here we're gonna uh, do it for data frames. Okay, uh, let's. I'm gonna skip this. Okay. You, you can read it, but uh, maybe we're getting digging a little too deep into the uh, the rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Reference class. All right. This is uh, the newest object-oriented system, and um, and it says reference class methods belong to objects, not functions. So this is this makes the object-oriented system in R a little bit more similar to some of the some other object-oriented systems that you've seen in other languages, if you've done that, where now the object, uh, now the uh, the functions or the methods belong to the object and not not the function. So in the S3 system and S4 system, you have like I have the function mean, and then I have specific versions of mean for this class of system or I have a, another version of mean for this other class. I have another version of mean for another class. Here, we have the object, and this object has functions associated with the object, not or, or methods associated with the object, and not the other way around. Okay. And the uh, and the big difference here also is that the reference class objects are muta mutable, meaning that so all of the other functions so far is you know. You create a function, you provide arguments inside the function, and then the function returns a result. And, <clears throat> and basically, if you, uh, you know, run a function on something, it returns a result, and if you want to use that new result, you either have to store the result somewhere, or you know, store it over another object and overwrite something. But if you don't store the result of the function, it basically gets calculated and then it disappears, right? So the kind of the the effects of the function are only retained if you store the results of that function. With reference class, when you run the method, it will actually change the object itself, okay? Because the method is associated with that object. Okay, so uh, so these reference class objects are kind of more aligned with some of the other languages that that you've seen. Okay. So for example, we can create a reference class using this function set reference class and we're going to create a new uh, a new class called an account, okay? And then we would create a new object of class account by doing account dollar sign new. Okay? 
And, and so, so far, this is all we've done. We've created a new reference class called account, and, uh, and then we, and we're creating a new object called account uh, dollar sign new, okay? <coughs> and then, so, what we're gonna do, if we, if, you know, for this to be useful, we're gonna say, okay, the account reference class is, uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be created using um, a, a type account, and inside the field, we have um, we have one balance, uh, one field called balance, and balance is going to be a numeric object. Okay. So if we want to create a, a new account, we just say store account dollar sign new. Okay, and then whoops, and then we feed it. We <coughs> inside that we give it the argument that says balance is one hundred dollars or one hundred whatever whatever it is, and so we have A, and we ask for the balance that says 100, okay? And then, you know, just like before, we can do A dollar sign balance is now 200, okay? So far, this is not that unusual, okay? But this is where, um, this is where things um, differ, okay? So here, I can say B, all right, so remember, A has a account balance of 100, okay? And so uh, here, I'm gonna create a copy of A. So B dollar sign, um, B is a, is a copy of A, okay? And so I've got B uh, dollar sign balance, it's 200, okay? And if I, <coughs> If I uh, set the balance in A to zero, and I ask for the balance in B, it returns zero. Okay, this is a very different. This is very different from what we're accustomed to, because normally, when we do this, this would normally create a copy of A. Okay, and that was that is now separate, right? But but because it's a reference class. Right, they have reference semantics, meaning that when I change the balance in A, it affects B as well because B <coughs> references A now. So this is a this is a, a very big difference with reference classes. Okay. Okay. So if you want to do this, you'd have to do A copy. Okay. So remember, we've reassigned the balance to A to be zero. Okay. If I create a copy and call that C, the dollar uh, balance of C is zero, and now I can reassign the balance in A to be a hundred, and then the balance in C is still zero. Okay, so if we want a copy, we have to use the specific kind of function copy. Okay, so we have like new and we have copy and things like that. Okay, so this is this is very very different from what we're accustomed to and seeing in R. Okay, so now we're gonna create some methods, okay? And so methods here um, affect the thing, okay, that, uh, that we have. So here, I'm gonna create two um, methods, withdraw and deposit, okay? And withdraw, basically, you're gonna put in a number for x and you're gonna subtract x from the balance and with deposit you're going to add x to the balance okay and notice because we want to affect the uh, the thing inside the actual object we're using the super assignment okay inside the method because uh, we want it to affect the actual um, actual field inside the object okay so we're using the uh, the super assignment rather than our regular assignment, okay? All right, so uh, so let's take a look at how this works, okay? So we're gonna create, now we're creating a new balance here, okay? Uh, of A, okay, with, uh, with 100. And so notice here I'm calling a function, the method deposit on A, okay? So when I call for the method deposit on A, deposit 100, the balance gets updated to 200, okay? 
Whereas before, if we had like a, a regular thing, if we wanted to update um, the, uh, the balance, we would have to do like deposit and we would call it. And then we, if we wanted to update the balance, we'd have to store the results of the deposit function back into the object A or something like that. If we want to modify something, we'd have to store, we'd have to do this. But because reference classes are mutable, we would uh, run, when we run this function, the function is deposit, okay, it, it alters the actual object A, okay, and that's, that's very different from what we're accustomed to as well. Um, okay, and then we have, a, a, we have another thing called contains. All right, and so this would be like if you wanted to inherit, um, if you want to inherit a reference, um, I'm sorry, the properties of a parent reference class. Okay, so so we've defined uh, maybe maybe we have a new special type of account called no overdraft. Okay, a no overdraft account prevents you from uh, from going negative here. Okay. And so the no overdraft is basically going to inherit everything from account, uh, from account, uh, the reference class account, okay? And then um, the no overdraft, though, however, has a new method for withdrawal. So it replaces the withdrawal function in account to just kind of have a check to make sure that, um, that you're not going to run out of money, okay? So if you're trying to withdraw more money than what you have, it'll say, stop, you don't have enough money. Okay, and so it'll return an error. So basically, all we're doing is we're just saying inherit all the properties from account, and then replace the method for withdraw with with this new function. Okay, and so uh, John account is going to be a new class of overdraft, and then so we do this, and then it it, it works. Okay. Uh, all right, and then so and it says all reference classes eventually inherit from the uh, super the environment reference class, and then um, and you can have things like uh, call super and field and all of this stuff. Okay, but those are those are reference classes. Uh, recognizing objects and methods, um, O type, which exists just in the package prior, if you're uh, trying to uh, decode some stuff. And then we've got uh, method dispatch. Method dispatch is this. Or we'll get a method. Okay. Um, okay, so that wraps up our talk on reference classes. I just want to talk a little bit about um, maybe our, your homework assignment. Let me. Um, so, homework three. Hope this this works. Okay, so uh, so this homework will be due uh, one week from Friday. There's a few parts. Okay, so I've I've given you some reading uh, where you're going to read up on dplyr and uh, regular expressions. Okay, and then uh, and then just kind of go through your notes on. Uh, the uh, OO field guide, which is just uh, from our textbook. Okay. All right, you're going to have some dplyr uh, exercises. So you're going to have to uh, install a package fuel economy. And, uh, you know, when you load that, uh, you can look at the uh, data vehicles. Yeah, data vehicles. Okay, so I got vehicles here. Let's uh, let's view vehicles and let's dim vehicles. So you know you got thirty three thousand vehicles listed in this uh, fuel economy thing, and we got lots and lots of this data here. Okay, um, and so I've just asked some simple questions in dplyr on you know uh, you know how many. Well, you don't have to use Deplier, but I think Deplier will make your life way easier, and I, and I strongly encourage you, you to do this, okay? So how many uh, different vehicles you have, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so 
uh, and then I do that. Okay, and then the uh, the next part is we're gonna do. Um, I'm gonna have you run some Arvest on uh, web scraping with uh, the site Baseball Reference. Okay, so Baseball Reference, it's just like if you're into sports, it's gonna have all of this. Um, Um, okay, so it's going to have all of this information. Uh, well, actually, okay, so I, I'm going to have to modify something in our instructions. So when you, uh, and then so what what I'm asking you to do is you're going to start on this page that lists off all of the teams, and then in the active franchises, so there's 30 baseball teams um, in, uh, in MLB, and you're going to go through each one, and you're going to go, and you're going to basically using the kind of automated uh, browser, Surfer, you're going to go in and you're going to download the information uh, from franchise history from this table for each for each thing, okay? So actually, I think I have to change it because uh, it's going to... Oh, no, I think it'll be fine. Okay, so... Um, and then you're going to just combine all of that into one, okay? So you're going to have to write some code into that. And then store all of those results in a table called baseball. Now, when you're writing your code and you test this out, this is, this is very, very important, okay? Do not... Um, do not run all 30 teams, okay? So... Basically, the first part you're going to want to be able to do is uh, extract the team. So use the selector gadget and figure out how to extract the names of the 30 teams. But then when you're running your, uh, your code to say, you know, go to the first team, go to the second team, go to the third team, this is important. Do not uh, spam hits to their web server, okay? Don't say run all 30 teams all at once, okay? This is uh, what we say, this is bad manners from the, uh, you know, while you're testing things out, only do like the first two or first three, okay? If, it, if you can get the loop to work for the first three teams, it'll work for all 30 teams, okay? You just have to make sure, if you, so just while you're getting the loop, if you're trying to figure out the loop to make sure that you can go to Arizona Diamondbacks and pull their information and then come back and go to the Atlanta Braves and pull their information. If you can get it, if you can get your work, loop working for the first two or the first three, great. Okay. So while you're kind of writing up your code to make sure it's working, just test it out on the first two or three teams first, and then if you can get it working the way you want it to work, then only at, then extend it to work for all thirty teams. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So then do that. Um, and then this is where I strongly encourage you. So I don't know how you guys have been doing your homework, but I hope you haven't been just like modifying the code inside here and then running knit HTML every single time, okay? Um, this is gonna be one of the cases where doing that is gonna slow you down, okay? So create a separate kind of R script and write your code in the R script. And then once you got all of your code working in the R script, then copy it back into the R Markdown thing, and then make sure it works in R Markdown, okay? And again, make sure uh, it, it renders properly and you upload it correctly to CCLE, okay? I, you know, I don't like having to be the bad guy when something messes up, but you know, you have to be responsible for making sure your thing uploaded properly and on time and things like that, so. So, you know, when you turn in your homework, make sure, make sure it's done that, okay? All right. Uh, when, you, uh, when you download the stuff from basketball, uh, not basketball, baseball reference, uh, where did it go? Okay, when you download stuff from here, okay, there's something called a non-breaking space, okay? Most of the time, like when you type on the computer and you, uh, say like my name is Miles and it, and it reaches the end of a line and uh, 
and your word processor says, oh, I've got, this doesn't fit anymore, I'm going to bring it to the next line, that's called a breaking space, okay? The space creates a break and you can, it, it moves it around. There's something called a non-breaking space, which basically looks like a space, but it acts like an actual character. And so, uh, so for something like, there's a non-breaking space in between Arizona and Diamondbacks. So if you were typing Arizona and Diamondbacks with a non-breaking space and it reaches the end of the line, it's not gonna break Arizona and put Diamondbacks on the next line. It's gonna move them both together, okay? And that creates complications when you're doing some text searching, okay? So I wrote some code for you because uh, last time I asked students to get rid of the non-breaking space like they couldn't figure it out. So, so I've written the code for you on cleaning up the non-breaking space, okay? So I've written all of this code. This goes, goes through the, um, each column and we'll find all the non-breaking spaces and replace them with a regular old space, okay? So that's, that's here for you. Um, there is one line here, okay? And depending on your system, this line might not work, okay? So this line should work, but it might not. And if it doesn't work, you might have to do, use this, okay? So then just comment this one out and uncomment this one, okay? And, and, um, and basically, uh, and these things just do the check, okay? So uh, when you've downloaded it, baseball, dollar sign, team, first one should be Arizona Diamondbacks, and it's just doing a quick check to make sure, is it Arizona Diamondbacks, and are they, uh, is the text equal, okay? So once you extract that, you can use Deplier to summarize the data, okay? And then, and then the last part is to use um, regular expressions to extract this information, okay? So here you've got, um, over here, you've got information stored as text where, you know, you've got like Kirk Gibson uh, acting as the managers for the Diamondbacks, okay? But what we want to do is we want to extract this information and store it in the table. And so, uh, so this, that part's the last part in the, um, in the assignment. That's probably the, little, the, the hardest part, okay? is doing uh, the regular expressions, figuring out the, um, the thing, okay? Uh, you guys should have received an invitation to Piazza last week or something, okay? Um, that's so you can kind of post questions about homework and stuff, okay? And, uh, and I'll try to answer, and you guys can answer each other as well. All right, we'll, uh, we'll end there. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Uh, good luck.